Starbase has exploded with activity. Work here is going on like crazy, from repairing the orbital launch mount after Flight 3, fixing up the chopsticks, working on the new Star Factory, working on the new office structure, building new boosters at the production site, and on top of all of that, we also had Ship 29 completing two static fire tests of its Raptor engines ahead of Starship's fourth flight. What's up, Star fans? I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. Let's start off with the Star Factory, which is getting closer and closer to completion with every passing week. This week there were more windows being installed to make it look fancy. And we had more outside cladding added to make it look, um, I don't know, black? It's all part of the SpaceX aesthetic, I guess. As you all probably know, every few days we put out a video with footage from around Starbase, from our robotic cameras and our photographers, like Mary, Sean, and myself. We have lots and lots of footage of the Star Factory work that's really worth checking out. It's always amazing how such a huge building can be built this quickly. One thing that might not even be visible in plain sight is that the building's facade is curved. In fact, Alex here in the script says that he was surprised that it was like that at all, but that it makes sense. The road also curves slightly around that area, and therefore it makes sense to make the facade parallel to the road. That's right, Alex. And I gotta say, when you're standing near the main gate for the production site or near Remedios Avenue, it looks really cool to see this massive monolithic building just sort of gently curving off into the distance. So if you're like Alex and you didn't know this was a thing, well, now you know. With the facade work still ongoing, more beams and columns are being added to the rest of the structure, which is yet to be built. This thing is still growing somehow. It's grown so much and for so long that there's already Starship production ongoing inside the sections of the building that were completed merely a few months ago. We got a peek this week into one of these sections where we saw a nose cone in the process of being fabricated. Another one can be seen much deeper into the building that looks to be much more complete. And some tooling can also be seen as well. Remember when they built nose cones in tent three and then rolled them outside to the windbreak to be outfitted with the rest of their hardware? Me too. Good times. Since all Starship version 1 vehicles are already produced and accounted for, this must be hardware for a future version of Starship like Starship version two, either Pathfinder hardware or actual flight hardware. It's still a mystery how much more different Starship version two will look relative to version one. When Elon announced version two, his comments were rather vague about it, just saying that it holds more propellant, reduces dry mass and improves reliability. Lots of types of changes could accomplish that, so it's not very specific. We always get people asking as to whether or not version two will be the one that gets stretched or not. And the quick answer is no. So far, Elon hasn't indicated that version two will be taller. In fact, he's talked about Starship being stretched on version three rather than on version two, but who knows when version three will come around? Probably not for a few more years. Going back to more construction work at Starbase, right next to the Star Factory is the future SpaceX office building, which has seen more progress this week, as is to be expected. Right outside of the Star Factory, we were able to see a booster aft section being fitted with its liquid oxygen header tank. This is a rare sight these days to see fabrication work out in the open, but it seems like SpaceX doesn't have tooling inside the factory yet, or maybe it's a space issue. But either way, it's a treat to see this step of the process. Given all the previous hardware we've seen before and barring any potential future test tanks, this booster aft could be for booster 17. So that would be perhaps for Starship's 10th flight. That just shows how far ahead SpaceX is in terms of constructing future vehicles. Speaking of future vehicles, we also saw the stacking of Booster 14's methane tank continue this week. Four of the five barrel sections that make up this tank are now stacked, and the last barrel section is staged right outside of Mega Bay 1. There's a good chance that in the next few weeks, Booster 14's tankage could be done being stacked. And in just a few more weeks after that, the rest of its structure should be complete as well. Of course, there is always a lot more work to be done after this to prepare it for testing and then for flight. But it's quite interesting to see the rate of production of these boosters. Booster 13's structure was completed about two months ago, and now they almost have an entire other booster completed. That's just amazing. Staying at the production site for a moment, we also saw Ship 31 being moved around inside of the high bay. Ship 31's position was first adjusted so it could be lifted by the high bay crane, 
and then it was lifted off its transport stand and onto the turntable inside of the high bay. Ship 31's move paved the way for Ship 29 to return back to the high bay. But to return to the production site, Ship 29 first needed to complete a couple static fires, and well, it did. First up, last Monday, Ship 29 conducted a six-engine static fire test in which SpaceX essentially tests the startup and shutdown sequence of all six of the ship's engines. As usual, it was a spectacular test, and we were able to see the Mach da... Uh, well, actually, we weren't able to see them because SpaceX parked a crane and a lift in front of our cameras, and so my slow-mo is a really nice slow-mo shot of a lift and a crane parked in, in front of our cameras. What we did get to see, though, was lots of dust being shook off Ship 29 during the test. And remember the mid-bay demolition? Well, Ship 29 was right next to that when it happened, so a bunch of the dust from the demolition was deposited on the vehicle. So all that dust is the remains of the mid-bay, and I guess the mid-bay will go to space in some shape or form once Ship 29 flies. But wait, there's more. That six-engine static fire test was not the only one that Ship 29 completed this week. Two days later on Wednesday, Ship 29 completed a single-engine test utilizing its header tanks. This is the same kind of test we saw with Ship 26 and Ship 28, where SpaceX simulated some of the vehicle conditions expected to occur once it reaches space and needs to relight its engine. Ship 28 had this engine relight test as an objective during its flight in order to prove that Starship can deorbit, but due to its attitude control issues, it couldn't perform this test. It makes sense that Ship 29 will now attempt the same thing again on its own flight since the test wasn't performed. So now Ship 29 should have completed acceptance testing ahead of its flight, but we don't really get official updates from SpaceX on these sort of things, so the proof for this will come in many weeks when Ship 29 is ready for flight and if it has no further engine tests. At least for the moment, no more testing seems to be on the schedule for Ship 29, as it was moved back to the high bay to prepare it for flight. We don't know much about how long these preparations will take or how much work will have to be done. One of the more obvious steps will have to be checking out the heat shield and replacing any damaged or missing tiles. Some tiles did get damaged or fall off during the static fire, but there were a lot fewer of them than on the previous few ships, so we've seen quite a lot of progress. Some other work that might need to be done besides the heat shield is whatever hardware changes that need to be done on the vehicle as a result of the Flight 3 mishap investigation. What will certainly not be flying, though, is Booster 4. You may remember from last week's episode that we talked about it being scrapped, and well, scrapping of it continued this week as well. We saw, for example, its common dome section being moved to Sanchez to be chopped up and recycled. While we're here at Sanchez, we've also seen more work done on sections 8 and 9 of the second Starship launch tower for Starbase. SpaceX is continuing to outfit these tower sections with hardware, ahead of them being stacked many, many months from now. Spoiler alert, we're working on a new Cape flyover where you'll be able to get a look at the remaining two tower sections that have been built there and are waiting to be transported here to Starbase. So keep your eyes out for when that video drops. And speaking of the Cape, I would be remiss if I didn't mention what's going on with Starship's other, other launch pad. You know, the one at 39A. As of the time of recording, only one orbital launch mount leg remains standing and it will probably be going away soon. Once again, stay tuned for our next Cape flyover, because we're going to discuss this, and I'm sure there'll be some wild speculation laid out as well. Of course, work is also happening here at Starbase's launch site. It's always a joke, but work is continuing on the orbital launch mount. But this time, it's good work, because now we have these cryogenic hoses installed back on the orbital launch mount and even the hood cover has been reinstalled. It took about a month for this to be completed after Flight 2, and this has been done essentially within two weeks of Flight 3, so it definitely looks like the amount of refurbishment work needed between launches is going down. Obviously, this is pretty far from SpaceX's targeted pace for Starship launches and pad refurbishment, but that's why they're iterating with pad designs. In fact, this might be exactly why we're seeing 39A's orbital launch mount legs 
being torn down. SpaceX has had lots and lots of data now for about three years on what to do and what not to do when it comes to building and using Starship launch pads. It's all a learning curve. That learning curve means not just repairing and iterating on the orbital launch mount, but also on the chopsticks and their carriage system. We saw a lot of work on these the last couple of weeks to fix what was broken or shaken loose as a result of the forces from Flight 3. Once again, just like with the orbital launch mount work, it looks like this work is not anywhere near as substantial as the work needed after Flight 2. So that's good progress, and hopefully this trend continues after Flight 4 and so on. One place where we have yet to see any major work is the ship quick disconnect arm, which is like right up here. You can't see it, but it's like right here. It does appear that this piece of hardware could have fared better than the rest, given that we've seen no major visible work. It could also be that SpaceX is focusing first on readying the orbital launch mount and leaving the ship cutie arm work for later when it should be, you know, needed for full stack testing. What is for sure is that all of this pales in comparison to the work needed after Flight 1. I mean, remember that? There was a giant crater under the pad. In fact, we had a special NSF Live this week with Dr. Phil Metzger talking about the pad destruction and a scientific research paper that Das and Jay, NSFers, helped co-author. It was a super interesting talk all around, so be sure to check that out too if you haven't already. It's so crazy that in just under a year since Flight 1, we've had two more Starship flights with a fourth just around the corner. It can be easy to downplay how much work goes on here at Starbase every week. It's so commonplace that one can just get used to it, but the scale and size of this effort is just mind-boggling. And the fact that all of this has happened in a year is just hard to even grasp. As usual, you can watch all of this play out in real time on Starbase Live, our 24-7 live stream from right here in Starbase. And of course, if you want to keep tabs on what's going on with the Starship pad at 39A, there is Space Coast Live. And there's also our McGregor Live, which is covering SpaceX's engine testing and Falcon 9 testing out in McGregor, Texas. So whichever 24-7 live stream from NSF you choose to hang out in, we thank you for it. All right, I think that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and as always, be excellent to each other.